uh, let's see, okay, I'm Cheyenne, uh, and uh, this, I'll talk a little bit about uh, mapping epistasis and quantitative traits, and if I have time, I would like to maybe spend five or ten minutes on some work we've been doing on modeling uh, medical imaging, 3D images, using some ideas from integral geometry. But uh, this is joint work with Lauren Crawford, Chris Wood, and Zhang Zhou. And we'll start with um, something that was mentioned earlier, which is this notion of ep epistasis, which are interactions between genes or interactions between alleles at different loci. And <clears throat> classically, there have been two definitions of this. One was called compositional epistasis, sometimes also called genetic epistasis. And this came from Bateson. And these are mutations that might be blocking one another, right? And then the more statistical version of this, which was uh, coined by Fisher, is basically anything that's uh, deviating from an additive combination of the effect of two loci. So these are the, and the perspective that I'm going to take in this talk is the latter. So classically, I would say in statistical genetics, there have been two problems. One is mapping traits, which are associating loci to phenotypes, and the other one is genomic selection, which is uh, predicting phenotypic variation via genotypic variation, right? And uh, genomic selection has been something that a lot of animal and crop breeders have been thinking about a lot. Um, and for both of these, you have Y, these are, let's say, your phenotype, and you have your genotype, which we're just encoding as 0, 1, 2, which are the number of minor alleles. And the classic version that we have done in trait mapping is a linear model. We can add a random effects term if you want or not. We can, you can talk about that. But you have your trait, you have your genotype, and you have a notion of effects. And then you have some noise or variation, right? So this is what you... Slow down? Slow down? Oh, okay. So this is your kind of classic <laughs> trait mapping model, okay? Uh, and these effects beta are going to be important because you think about these effects as how important any particular locus is, right, with respect to explaining variation in the trait. So this is a classic idea. Now, what people have looked at and what they found in, uh, in the uh, genomic selection literature is nonlinear models are better at explaining variation. So if you have a function f, which is nonlinear, and let's say you want to explain crop yield from genotypes, um, there are a variety of papers that show that you get a better estimate of, uh, you know, how much of variation in yield that you can explain. So this was something that's been observed, and one of the models that they've used a lot, uh, the function f of x is written as a linear combination of Gaussians. Okay, and a picture of this would be this little thing in 2D. So if you think of just looking at two loci, you have a little bump at each locus, and you can add it or subtract it by some amount, and this is what your uh, function values look like. Now, one of the issues that you get when you think about genomic selection is the effect of each locus is lost a little bit. You don't know how much each locus is contributing to, this, uh, to the variation. So this is also why genomic, this type of nonlinear model, has not been used very much for trait mapping because you don't have that notion of a locus, an effect size. So there's this idea that in the, the statistical conventional wisdom that for high dimensional regression problems, smooth nonlinear functions perform better, they're more accurate, uh, but variable selection or getting an estimate of uh, the importance of a single variable coordinate is a lot easier for linear regression. And in genomics, you can think of this as people are using nonlinear models for genomic selection, but people again use linear models for mapping quantitative traits, right? So there's this uh, dichotomy. And what I'm going to talk about is can you use a single model for both trait mapping and genomic selection? Um, and can you do this in a way that's scalable? Uh, so you can run it on large GWAS studies, for example. And can you do as well as some of these nonlinear models in predicting um, variation in the phenotype? So that's, that's the program. And again, it's going to key off of this, that smooth nonlinear functions predict more accurately than linear functions. And the other part is 
that, that allows us to do some of this work is that a uh, smooth nonlinear function can be reasonably approximated by a linear function. So these are going to be the key ideas, okay? So a very common model that's been used a lot in various types of regression problems are these types of kernel uh, models, which basically mean you fit your regression function, so that's just your least squares f of xi minus yi, and then you have some type of smoothness penalty. Okay, on these functions, that's how you regularize them so you don't overfit. And one of the reasons these functions have been used is that if you minimize the above uh, loss function at the top, you get a nice form of it. And you get that your regression function is a linear combination of a bunch of kernel functions centered around your data points. Yeah? So what is, uh, okay, let me start. So you replace in the linear, in the linear model, you replace the, 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 the linear matrix with some function f mm -hmm. here. Yeah. What f is constrained to be, um, what is that h? f is taken from h. A, a, h is some class, right? It's formally a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, right? Uh, so you can think of this as some class of nonlinear functions, okay? And there's a penalty on f, which is called a RKHS norm, which is a particular type of norm, uh, which I'm not going to specify in detail. But what happens if you do that minimization in that class of functions with that norm, you get, uh, you get your minimizer will take this form that it's a linear combination of these kernel functions. These kernel functions have to have the property that they're sem positive semi-definite. And what's nice about this is that function class could be infinite dimensional, right? Whereas your optimization problem now is finite dimensional because it's only over those alphas. So, That's a tiny question. Yeah. What you define as smooth, what you define as smooth um, is, I'll, I'll, I'll actually show you in a little bit, but if you think about this RKHS, it's, it's a, you can think of it as a penalty uh, in ter and one way of characterizing this is a penalty in terms of the number of derivatives or the size of derivatives of these functions, okay? But I will more formally show you why this is smooth in, in a few slides, okay? So just to emphasize, so if you like look at that middle equation, right? Mm -hmm. That's like f of x, it's the linear combination of k of x with the, uh, all the other data points. Oh. Yes, with all the other data points, exactly. And that, those alpha i's, a lot of them could be zero, right? So they could be zero, they could be very small, yeah. And I see. And so if you, okay, and so if, and so because you're applying this over all the data points in your sample, the real points that matter are all going to be in K because those are all the pairwise points, right? That's exactly. Those are all my pairwise and points. And that's called the kernel. And that's called the kernel. And you have like, efficient ways to solve this, right? Is and we, you have, we have very efficient ways of solving this. Okay. okay? Uh, and, yeah. The, the equation in the middle, that's the solution for the last one? Yeah. This is, if I were to minimize this, the solution would take this form. Yeah, exactly. Okay? Is there more questions? Please ask questions. I mean, as, as we go through this, please ask questions. Okay. So, in a way, what these kernel methods let you do is you have this original regression in this p dimensional space. Now we can turn this into this nonlinear regression problem, right? But it's again, it's linear, but it's linear in the kernel matrix, right? Because you. N is a sample size, exactly. The, uh, the feature size, that's exactly right. And, but the problem we have is a classic idea of an effect or variable selection is lost because I'm now working you know, in this n-dimensional coordinate space. I right. can't figure out which, which feature it was. I can't figure out which feature it was, right? So now the question is, can we come back and figure out which feature was most relevant, right? So that's the question. Um, so we're going to put together a Bayesian kernel model that does this. The Bayesian part is actually not so relevant here. Uh, what's relevant is how to get back from this nonlinear function to figuring out which coordinates are important. And kind of the key idea is, how do I define the notion of an effect size for these nonlinear models? Okay, yeah? How is that different from support vector? It, uh, support vector machines are one type of, so if I were to come back here, and instead of using the square loss, I was going to look at classification, and you look at what's called the hinge loss, this is a support vector machine. Okay, so it's one particular type. Yeah. Okay. <laughs>
So this is what I was telling you again. One way of thinking about this space of functions is as a linear combination of these kernel functions with some, uh, I didn't define this, but this norm being small or not infinite, okay? Another way of thinking about this is you have this kernel function, like for example, the Gaussian. I can look at its eigenfunctions and eigenvalues. In the case of the Gaussian, the eigenfunctions are gonna be sines and cosines, it turns out. Uh, and then what I can think of is a linear combination of these eigenfunctions, is the span of this function space, right? So that's another way of thinking about it. Uh, and so now I have something that's linear again in... Can you explain that again? Yeah, so you have a kernel function, it's called K, right? And think of it as a Gaussian, okay? And what you can do is you can look at its eigenfunctions, right? So basically you can look at this integral equation and this will give me the eigenvalues and the eigenfunctions, okay? Now what you can say is instead of thinking about my functions f as a linear combination of these kernel functions, I can think of them as a linear combination of the eigenfunctions, okay? What does eigenfunction mean? Good question, okay? So this is my kernel function. It's a function of two points, let's say x1 and x2, right? Okay? Now what I can do is I can, I can define an integral. So this is a function of u and x, right? Psi here is another function, okay? And I can ask if I look at this integral, do I get back something that looks like that original function? So if I were to think about this instead of functions, I can think of these in terms of matrices and vectors, okay? If I give you that kernel ma matrix, right? Now I can ask what are the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of that kernel matrix, right? So that would be the discrete form of it when I think about these as matrices and vectors. Now I'm asking you to think about the exact same thing, but with functions and the analog of a matrix as an integral operator, okay? And so that's exactly what's going on. So if I gave you a covariance matrix, right, what could you do? You can think of modeling your data in terms of the covariance matrix. You could also take the covariance matrix, do PCA using it, right, project onto the top eigenvectors and do the same thing, right? And that's all I've said here. This is the exact analog. I can think of that kernel function and instead of working with the kernel function, I can basically do the analog of an eigen decomposition of it, and I can work with the eigenfunctions instead. Okay? So that's what's going on there. Okay? Now... Oh, sorry. So it's like breaking in Fourier transform, breaking into cosines... That's exactly right. And we'll, breaking into... Yeah. And we'll actually break it down into cosines and sines in about two slides. Okay? Okay. So... Um, where I work. Huh. Mm. It's okay. Okay. So this is the same slide as what we said before, is you can think of this as two ways. We can think of it in terms of a combination of these kernel functions, or we can think of it as a combination in terms of these eigenfunctions. Okay? And now I'm so sorry. It's all good. <laughs> uh, just hit, hit, hit the X. Uh, X. Yeah, no. Uh, skip, 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 skip. skip. Uh, okay. And then... Close. This guy? Yeah, that guy. Okay, great. All right. Now... <laughs> So just like, just like you could think of this very much in terms of what we do with the covariance matrix, right? You're doing the same thing in a way with this kernel matrix. So you can get back this kernel matrix by taking these eigenfunctions and multiplying it by their transpose or their adjoint. Okay, so this is really all we're saying here. And what we're saying is that these alphas and these Cs are related, and this is how they're related. They, they're, there's a really linear relation here. And hopefully soon I'll show you where I'm getting with this. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to be able to map back from this kernel space back to this linear function and then come back from here back to the original p-dimensional space. I'm trying to give you a machinery to be able to do these mappings is what I'm, I'm trying to do. Okay? Okay. So now this is probably the key slide in this talk. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Go again, please. Uh, go back. Yeah. Sure. No, I don't mind at all. Yes. Yeah, so, um, yes. Yeah, so, so, um, k is n-dimensional. K, k. K is n by n. Yeah. Yeah. 
n is your number of observations. Number of, and, and p is the number of variables you have. The number, okay. 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 So the number of loci or the number of SNPs, for example. Yeah. In, in your psi there, it is what dimensional? I'm sorry. What dimension is your psi? Is it all? Psi could be possibly infinite dimensional. Yeah. But in in a way, when I look at that K matrix K because it's n by n. On the actual data, it cannot be more than n-dimensional, right? In some sense, because that's all of the variation that you have. Every operation here, not the cycle, not the number of cycles, but every operation in, in the, your three um, places there is polynomial or a linear. Uh, these are all linear operations, right? So x beta is again linear, okay. right? Um, this right here again, it's linear. Right, because I'm just writing these all out in matrix form. Again, this is also linear because these are just matrices. Okay, so all of these operations here are linear. Okay. I am. And so, so, so what? So, the, okay. So the question is: once you've constructed that K matrix, everything is linear. Oh, yeah. Right? Now, in constructing that matrix K, things can be nonlinear. And if you want to worry about that complexity, uh, let's, let's go back and just say that. Uh, sorry. I'll go. Well, I could have gone forward. So let's say this is a kernel that I used. Okay? Let's say I used this exponential kernel, right? So we can ask what's the complexity in constructing that kernel. Well, this is a subtraction. That's not too bad. Okay, and then this is just computing the norm of this and squaring it. Again, that's not going to be so bad. And then you just exponentiate that. So again, computationally, this is not going to be that terrible. Okay. Okay. So what you want to do is this is my nonlinear function. Right? which I've written in terms of a linear combination of the eigenvectors you can think about, or the eigenfunctions. And I'm asking you, can you fun come up with a linear function, x beta, that's going to approximate this nonlinear function? Okay, that's, that's a question that we're asking. And you know, one thing is, okay, let's just try to do some linear algebra and multiply both of these by the inverse of x. Right? And there's a reason why this is in quotes, because it's fake math. Right, because the, the units don't line up, the, the, the indices don't line up, right? So this is fake math, so we can't do it. So the next four slides are going to be developing math or some representation such that this is no longer fake math. Okay, that, that, that's what we're going to try to do and try to show. Okay. fake math, you mean that this approximation to give it some precise Well, yeah, to actually to show that I can write down an approximation where I can project back onto my real data, right? And it's well defined and computationally efficient, right? That's what I mean by real math. I could program it into my, my, my computer, and R or MATLAB will not yell at me. Okay? So it turns out that if these kernel functions are shift invariant, there's an old theorem by Bachner which says that you can rewrite them as a linear combination of sines and cosines. This is what we were showing earlier, right? And so I can think of this linear combinations of sines and cosines actually as an expectation. I can think of this as a random process where I draw my omegas according to, uh, well, the Fourier transform of this kernel, and then I just compute this expectation, okay? What this suggests is that what I can do is I can actually, sorry, I can draw these Ws, P of them, from the Fourier transform, and then I can approximate this expectation by an empirical version of it, right? I can basically do this approximation of the kernel, okay? So as a sampling process, what I can actually do is draw these Ws from the Fourier transform. These are just the phases, and now I define this omega and this B, and I can rewrite this z, these are my eigenfunctions or eigenvectors here, right, in terms of these cosines. And these cosines will define this approximate kernel. And what's important is these are p-dimensional. And you'll see why that's true in a second. 
Okay, this is my approximate kernel. Now in the approximate kernel, again, I can show that this alpha times these k's, these linear combinations, can be written in this following form. Yeah. So what I've done is this kernel, right, we, we've shown because of basically some Fourier theory that it's the expectation of the eigenfunctions, right? And you take the transpose of the eigenfunctions or the adjoints, right? And then just integrate that with respect to these random omegas, which are given by the Fourier transform of your kernel function. Now, instead of taking this expectation over all Ws, you just approximate it by taking a linear, but taking P of them, okay? So this is an empirical approximation of this omega. Can you start at the end of the kernel? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay, so then like, what do you do next? Step us through, yeah. Okay, so let, this is exactly what you do. Okay, okay. You have the kernel, okay, and you know what its eigenfunctions are, they're sines and cosines. Okay, because it's shift invariant. And you also know it's... N of N or something like that? We're gonna take P of them. P of them. Okay. But that P could be bigger than N. P is going to be bigger than N. So okay. let's, in a concrete example, let's say we're looking at uh, a GWAS and we have P is equal to half a million and N is equal to, let's say, 10,000, just for a concrete example, okay? So you're going to take P of them, okay? And what we're going to do is we draw P of these based on the Fourier transform of the kernel function, which if it's a Gaussian, it's a Gaussian. Draw from where? A Gaussian. Okay. So we're drawing from a Gaussian here, okay? F of W is a Gaussian. Okay. Okay. So I'm drawing P of these IID from this Gaussian. And then I just take a random phase, okay, which is again between zero and two pi. And I know my eigenfunctions are just cosines. And the phase is what? Omega? Omega, uh, the phase is B. So omega are, my, uh, are the, are the uh, frequencies of the sines and cosines, and B is the phase. So you pick, okay, so you, you draw a random omega, right? Yep. And then you draw a random B, Yep. right? And then you, you plug that into that function. And then you plug that into this function, okay? okay but then how is that connected to P itself? What, uh, what do you mean? Specific feature. To a spe we haven't gotten there yet. Okay. Right now, this is not connected to a specific feature. We will get there in a second, okay? This is a representation I'm going to use to get back to the specific feature. So you're basically picking random, like, cosine functions. I'm picking random cosine functions, okay? And you're picking P of them. I'm picking okay, P of that's them. All you're doing. That's all I'm doing. Okay. That's all I've done, right? And so this kernel I can just rewrite in terms of Z transpose Z, right? Just because it's the okay, same thing. And then you apply that function to X, right? Yep. So, so this is what we're going to do. Now I have XB. I can write this in terms of Z transpose C, and now the math works out because this is P dimensional. Right, so I've given you a representation using these random signs, these random cosines that lets me project back onto my data. So, yeah. Yes. So we, there's this question about why would k be a good approximation of k tilde? Okay. Now, if it were really true that we were looking in low dimensions and these kernels were very non-smooth, it would not be true. K would not be a good approximation of K tilde. So this is essential, very essential here, is a kernel function is smooth, and you're looking at high dimensions because you have a lot of P, because P is big then, right? Otherwise, that approximation would not be good, right? So that's kind of inherent in this. But what it lets us do is it lets us project back onto my data, okay? So this is all we've done. We've basically now come up with a way of going into this nonlinear space, working with these kernels, and using linear operations to project back onto my data. That's what I've spent I don't know how many minutes telling you about. Okay? Yeah? So if you look at x, x is going to be n by p, right? Because you have n observations and p coordinates, let's say p loci, right? Uh, Z is, again, going to be P by N, right? Because I have P of these sines and cosines, right? And I have N observations, right? And then, and, and then C is going to be something that I think is P by 1. Okay? So the inverse X? We will get to that in a second. 
You'll actually have to end up doing a pseudo inverse because it's not, but yeah, we'll get to that in a second. Yeah? Yes. So, okay, so one of the things that, uh, that, that, that is true is that um, if your kernel is shift invariant, you can always use this Fourier expansion. If your kernel is not shift invariant, you can't. So if you were to use a polynomial kernel, you'd have to use a different type of expansion. Because it's not shift invariant. Because it's not shift invariant. You can specify it, what it is for the uh, polynomial, but it would be different. Okay? Okay. Okay, so the point, though, is now we've given a way of walking back and forth f from the original space, right, to this nonlinear, back to this basis, and from this basis we can come back to a linear regression. So this is kind of what I've specified so far, okay? So now <clears throat> the rest of this talk is using that transformation and applying it to very standard Bayesian linear regression models, specifically factor models is what we're doing. And that's how we're going to be, be doing the rest of the mapping, okay? So if I were to think about each of the y i's, I can think of it as some function, some likelihood function of y given u i, mu i and mu i, you can think of, if you're doing regression, it's just z transpose c, right? If you're doing classification, it would be a logit function or a probit function, right? So it depends on what you're doing. And you can think of these k's as just a vector of is that the response. That's the phenotype of the ith individual, exactly. Okay. And it's a function of why? Uh, so I'm just saying we can think of it as a function of y given ui, right? I, I'm just trying to write out the likelihood. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All I'm doing here is trying to write out the likelihood. All right. So to make this a little bit more efficient, you can think of taking these kernels and factorizing them and then working with these eigenfunctions and eigenvectors of the kernel, right? So that's what another step that you can do. So alpha, you can write as this kernel matrix times Z transpose C, and then you, you can diagonalize this so you can think about working with these factors theta, okay? This is again to reduce rank and just make this more computationally efficient. And so basically, you can get from the C back to this beta right, using the transformation that we had before. And if you notice, I no longer have a Z inverse here, I have a Z a little dagger, because that inverse is typically not, well, not defined, so you use a pseudo inverse to, to instead, okay? So at the end of the day, what you basically can write down is you can write down a hierarchical factor model if your traits are real, and putting a prior on this theta, which is a multivariate normal, implicitly puts a normal prior on your beta. And if you wanted to do classification, you could do the same thing. And if you wanted to put in uh, a kinship matrix or a batch matrix, you can extend this same approach to a, the linear mixed model setting, okay? So this is kind of the, the basic machinery. And this slide just says, everything here can be done with very standard uh, Bayesian inference or Gibbs sampling, okay? And this step two is basically what we've added, right? This is being able to map back from these Gaussian process kernel models back to your, um, your betas, okay? Now, once you have these beta hats, how can you get some notion of association? So you can just say, well, you can e extend the idea of a posterior probability of association right, to this setting, so you have these beta hats and you can just think about a threshold and you set that and you can try to control false discovery rate or something like that and, and this is what we end up doing. Now, there, one of the things I wanna show you next is why these kernels capture nonlinear interactions, okay? Because I told you somehow this thing is about mapping epistasis, which is nonlinear interactions. So if you had a polynomial or a quadratic kernel, these are my vectors u and v. You can just start expanding them out and you get something that looks like this and here you see the interactions of the different terms. So similarly, if we were to look at this Gaussian kernel, we could decompose it in this way. And then if you do a Taylor expansion, you just start, again, you start seeing that if I look at coordinate subsets of the p-coordinates, you get this notion of, uh, of interaction term, okay? This may not be the most intuitive, 
You don't know exactly what the epistatic interactions are, but this is specifying it. And we'll talk about that. I'll talk about that in a second, okay? Now, the same kind of kernel idea we can adapt. And you can adapt this, and we did this in another paper, into something which is called marginal epistatic effects. So you can say that Y is my phenotype. I can model it as a linear combination. This is a linear term of, um, well, of all of the alleles, right? Then what I can do is I can look at all of the alleles except for the kth allele, and I can, again, have a linear term. So this is just in terms of the kth allele. This is in terms of all the other alleles. And now what I can say is, if I look at the kth allele interacting with all the other alleles, that's what I'm looking at here, and I'm weighting it by this alpha. So this is just a quadratic term. These are pairwise interactions, right? So if you look at this a little bit more carefully, this is just a variance component or a mixed effects model, where this m sub k comes from this particular kernel function, which is a second order kernel function. And this g sub k is a marginal epistatic effect, which you can write down in this way. So before I was doing things with a Gaussian kernel, an alternative is you can just do things with this quadratic or second order kernel, and then you can really pick up particular type of pairwise interactions, okay? So um, this is sad, the lamp is dying. Um, So what we did was the idea, we compared this pairwise interaction on a real data set, on an EQTL data set. We compared it to Plink, and we compared it to algorithms like Gemma, which is related to Emma, which are straight linear mixed models. But the idea behind thinking about these epistatic effects and what comes back to the, also the kernel model is the advantage of a marginal epistatic model is you don't have to look at all pairwise tests. You look at how each of the loci have a linear effect and then a nonlinear effect with all the other loci, and that reduces down the, uh, the number of tests, the, the testing burden a ton, okay? So let me skip this and show you some results on some real data. So we, we applied this to simulations as well as real data, and so we're looking at the Welcome Trust uh, uh, mouse data set, right? There are 129 traits, um, and we're looking at a bunch of regression models. And we're basically doing 80-20 splits. And one accuracy we looked at is a mean square prediction error. And all this is showing is that this kernel model is doing as good of a job as a nonlinear SVM. Okay, or this would, this would also be identical to a Gaussian process. So it's doing as well as the geno top genomic selection algorithms, but it can also give you a notion of an effect size. And I'll talk about that in a second. Now, the other thing that you can do, this, this red is a kernel model, and uh, I guess the, the other one is the SVM. This is just showing that the nonlinear models are giving you the best predictive performance across all of these traits, and in some cases it's actually quite different, right? It does a lot better. Now, you can ask this question about, well, why are these nonlinear models possibly doing better? And you can basically do a decomposition of this, and you can say, okay, how much do linear effects explain the, um, the variance in this trait? How much do pairwise interactions explain variance in this trait, third order interactions, and cage effects? And you see for some of these traits, especially like asthma, right, um, these higher order interactions or these cage effects are very, very strong. They're actually quite strong. Uh, and so there really are nonlinear terms that seem to be in there. Uh, we also looked at people. Uh, again, the uh, Welcome Trust data. And what I'm just showing here are um, in blue, if you look at the marginal epistasis, these are loci that were found using the linear models as well. And then the red are ones that we found looking at the marginal epistasis, right? So these are possibly inter epistatic interactions. You know, on those, were they replicated later in larger studies? Some of these were, I don't remember which ones. And it would be interesting to see if. Because, you know, I mean, since that time, there's like studies that Yeah, are absolutely, yeah. Yeah, we should check that. We, I, we, we didn't, right? Um, same picture in uh, type 1 diabetes, okay? Uh, so we're lo looking to do this when you're looking, just looking at summaries, uh, interest in local estimates of heritability. There's, a thing, I think, something that I think is really interesting with respect to 
relatedness and epistasis. So um, in some of the quantitative genetics literature, there's been a lot of, uh, there's been a debate. And the debate's been about a lot of people who do human mapping versus people who look at uh, model organisms. With a lot of people who look at model organisms, for example, Trudy McKay, saying that they're very, very strong epistatic effects. Whereas a lot of people looking at, at large human studies saying, epistasis is negligible, we don't need to worry about it, right? And, and, I, and I think part of it is that when people are looking at these um, animal models, there's a lot of relatedness. They're, you have breeding designs and there's this very strong structure. Uh, whereas when people are looking at uh, the human data, it's a lot weaker, that relatedness. And also a very standard approach that you're going to do is you're going to try to model out all of the relatedness, right? Uh, when we do things like GWAS. So one of the things that you can show if you just start working, playing around with the breeder's equation through these quantitative genetics models, is that you see you're much more empowered to find epistatic interactions in a related population. So if you have like in strong inbreeding, for example, you have, can very, you have a lot more power to detect epistatic effects. So one of the things that is going to happen when you correct for population structure is you're going to lose some of the power to uh, detect epistatic effects. So it's interesting what kind of trade-off you want to think about there. And there are, you know, people are always trying to make algorithms faster, more interesting, and things like that. So uh, that was kind of the idea about epistasis. If you guys are interested, I could spend five minutes talking about some modeling sh surfaces and shapes for imaging, medical imaging applications, or I can end and we can talk more about epistasis and these kernel models. Images? Images? Okay. Okay. So one of the things that I think was really interesting about what, what, so moving from what Linnaeus had done with respect to shapes to Darwin, right, Linnaeus thought about organisms and shapes as platonic ideals. And one of the things that was really instrumental about the way Darwin thought about organisms is variation. The ideal is not so important. What's really important is variation in these organisms. And so we're really interested in modeling variations in shapes. One of my colleagues, he's interested in heel bones and other bones, and we want to model variation in them, and we want to measure distances between them and things like that. Um, I'm also going to show you some results on using this to model glioblastomas, the structure of a glioblastoma. But these are classically three different ways people have thought about shapes, but I'll, I'll kind of skip that. So the classic way is landmarks. You take your shape, you put down a lot of points. Each point is a vector three space. You stack them together, right? And that's your shape, okay? Now what's becoming interesting is more and more that's this isn't how we store shapes, not just as a bunch of points. We actually have repositories of 3D meshes that come from CT scans, and we want to use those. We don't want to just discretize them. We actually want to use them and model them, okay? So let me, so one way people try to do this is you take one shape, take another shape, take little patches and define a diffeomorphism or map between them, ask how much energy it takes for that map, integrate that, and that's your distance, okay? Now the problem in this approach, so this is just your, you, showing that you can take a coffee cup into a donut. But the problem is this is not, you can't always do this. So if you look at fly wings and you look at genetic variations in fly wings, you're gonna get cases where there's a qualitative change. It's not a quantitative change, right? You lose a lobe, you add a vein, right? You can't smoothly map one to the other. So the question is, what can we do in those cases? And what I'm gonna do is in a few slides, I'm gonna show you a transformation that turns shapes into vectors. We know how to work with vectors. The reason why you can't do this is that there's no smooth transformation from one fly wing to the other fly wing. Because in terms of the features, how do I add a vein? Or how do I drop a lobe, right? So that's, that's the problem. There's no, there's no notion of correspondence, right? Because you've lost a part or you've gained a part, okay? So the question is, how do I model cases where I might have gained a part or lost a part? And what I'm going to show you is a transformation that lets me do this. And ideally, this transformation, we won't lose information, and we'll turn the shape into some type of mathematical object that I can work with, OK? And just as an example, I'm going to use something called the Euler characteristic, which for any mesh, 
you can think of as the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces. Okay? Okay. This is a heel bone. This is a plane. And there's something called a height function, which is I take the perpendicular of the plane and I run it through the heel bone. Right? I go some distance r and I look at the sublevel set and I can compute its Euler characteristic. And so I get something called an Euler characteristic curve. I'll do this from many directions. So this is a mouse embryo heart, and I'm just looking in one direction, and I'm looking at the sublevel set, everything from A below, and basically I'm looking at the Euler characteristic of that. Okay, so this is a hand. Can you, can you like, yeah. is, so this is my hand. I'm going from below, okay? And what I'm looking at is I'm computing the Euler characteristic as I basically move through that hand from below. And that's that middle curve. That's the Euler characteristic curve. Actually, I have a pointer. So if I were to scan from here above, right, and I would, to compute the Euler characteristic here in 2D, this is just gonna be uh, here vertices minus edges, okay, you'd get this curve. And I can integrate that and zero mean it and I get that curve. Okay? This is how you do Yeah? I'm sorry? This is how you do So this is very related to how people do micro CT scans, right? So the class, there's something called the radon transform, which is you take your object, you pass energy through it, and you look at the projection, and you take this from many directions, and from that you reconstruct the object. So yes, exactly. This is how people do CAT scans and CT scans, or variations of this, okay? So, we actually have theories for how many directions you need, but we'll skip that, and I'll skip this slide. So I, what I wanted to show you, and I'll get to this in a second, is we had 106 primate heel bones. We measured the distance between them by basically turning these into curves, right? And measuring the distance between the two curves, and then summing it over all directions, okay? And then these are these directions, and if I just project it into 2D, right, using multidimensional scaling, this is what you get. These are the great apes, these are lesser apes, these are uh, old world monkeys, new world monkeys, these are lemurs. This is the same thing, nicer picture. Now, what we're really doing with this now is we're using it for regression. So this is a picture of a glioblastoma. If you segment it, you have this 3D, this is a 2D slice of the 3D structure. And using the same tool, I can say I have 92 patients with matched gene expression and MRI data. And what I can say is I have these are my gene expression features. These are morphometric features that radiologists you more commonly use. These are just some volumetric features. These are the topological features that we've extracted using this Euler characteristic transform. And we're just looking at two responses, disease-free survival and overall survival. And we're saying, how much variation can we explain? And you know, I'm just showing this because we do a little bit better. But what, what we're doing now with this is we're also starting to ask the question of, what subparts of the image are most relevant in explaining this variation, right? And again, the idea here is to build representations of these more complex objects such that we can do linear regression, okay? And I will stop now. And if anyone wants to see a very weird but possibly funny video, there is um, there's a YouTube video of John Milner, who's a very well-known geometer, who's talking about, uh, from Darcy Thompson's book, on growth and form, which is a beautiful book, on whether there's a conformal map between the skull of a human and a baboon. So I'll stop with that. <laughs> yeah. Prediction performance of the nonlinear kernel uh, regression is better than the new one, but why is uh, beta from uh, your model better than simply fit a linear model? It's just capturing the linear effects still. Right? It is. So that I think that's a really good question. So the so the question is okay. Clearly, why you're doing prediction, I get that's better, yeah. right? So if we were to compare what we did versus, let's say, you know, whatever. Uh, sparse linear regression, right? Why would your betas for our method be any better than the other one, right? Okay, so... Sorry, I will... At the end of the day... At the end of the day, right? This is all we're doing, okay? 
we're just projecting it back, okay? Now, when you do a regret, okay. Another way of thinking about this problem is you fit your function f of x, your nonlinear function, then you project, project it back onto your data, okay? So how do you do that? Well, the simplest version is least squares or ordinary least squares, right? Uh, but maybe that won't work as well, so maybe you do sparse regression, right? So if you think about everything that we're doing at the end of the day, you can think of it as just different types of regularization or different types of priors, right? And it could well be that putting the priors on these factor models and going through that, this whole kernel matrix approach is just a better prior than just a linear one, right? I mean, that's one explanation, right? Uh, it's, so why is it better? It's not magic, right? But somehow first fitting this nonlinear function and projecting back is better than fitting just a straight linear function, right? Yeah. Um, is it possible to say that in linear regression, then our betas are basically the part of each SNP, and we can also view them as scores for each SNP? Yes. While in the, in the kernel method, so we don't use them as, as the linear combination, but we get a transform back that just gives us the score for each allele. That's exactly right. And that's what we are doing. We're getting transformed back which gives us a score for each allele, right? And for whatever reason, that seems to be picking up some betas which our linear model did not pick up. Yeah, so that might be... That, maybe that's the answer, yeah. I, I, I don't know. Yeah? So I was just going to ask, you know, obviously this kernel method you know, has regularization that you have and so I'm wondering if the trade-off between regularization of your effects versus dimensionality reduction that you would get with deep learning or something where you have interactions with people so dimensionality reduction. Obviously, figuring out the effects of individual steps becomes a lot harder in a system like that, but I guess the question is in terms of predictive performance. You do lose some predictive performance by not having dimensionality reduction also occur. So if you were to try to use some kind of kernel method, and you didn't do regret, uh, didn't do some type of regularization, the performance is worse. Yeah. So, you, so you need that. So now one thing that you can ask is, is there a way of taking your result from deep learning, right, and projecting it back onto the data and getting uh, an effect size? And yes, there's actually, if you just come up with the right transformation, there's nothing that'll stop you from doing that, right? So you could have just taken the out from a deep learning approach, project that back onto your, your original data and try to read off what the effects would be. Now, there's another thing here which I didn't say is we're not, we have a Bayesian method, right? And if you have a Bayesian method, one of the things that you can sometimes use it for is we could do more than just pro project back to the betas and look at them. You can ask, start asking, because you've done all these simulations, right? You've done these MCMC runs of how each beta, each coordinate of the beta co-varies with each other, right? So you can actually look at a beta by beta matrix. Right? And you can look at that covariance, and you can use that to select, for example, more intelligently. You know, these guys are all covariant, well then you just need one of them, if you want to think about it that way, right? So, so yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. I'm sorry? How did you select? Or you get the yeah. So, the, 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 so what I told you we did, which is probably not the smartest thing, is we take our betas, we have our MCMC runs of the betas, right? You take the, I don't know, the median or the mean, right? And then you look at it above a particular threshold, which you can set by some FDR value, for example, okay? Now what I'm saying is if you, what you could do, which might be a little bit more intelligent, is you have all these MCMC runs, Right? Construct a covariance matrix, right? which is P by P of the betas. Then you can ask, removing which of these coordinates will change the KL divergence right? between that normal model with versus the normal model without. Right? And then start selecting those, for example. Right? Or use something about that covariance matrix right? to pick the betas that might be more intelligent and more powerful. You know, I, I didn't do that. Uh, this former student, Lauren, I think they just wrote up a paper doing that, right? But the fact is, if you have all these samples, maybe you want to do something more with them, right? By looking at variance, okay? <laughs>
should probably stop. Okay, thank you.